Super Mario RPG is a game known for having a ridiculous amount of secrets, with cameos from other Nintendo franchises like Zelda and Metroid, entire cutscenes that are easily missable if you don't know about them, and some fun battle items you have to jump through an insane amount of hoops for to obtain. I've previously gone over pretty much every single secret you can find in the first half of the game, so this time I'll be doing the same for the second half and beyond, which includes a lot of stuff that wasn't in the original, like some new text entries that reveal each party member's secret thoughts. But before we get started on that, a quick word from this video's sponsor, Netflix Games and Hades. Yeah, that Hades. Big news for all the gamers out there with a Netflix subscription, the critically acclaimed Hades is now available on Netflix Games. Yeah, that's right, if you have a Netflix subscription, you can now dive into this epic roguelike dungeon crawler at no extra cost. Let me show you how to get started with Hades on the Netflix app. It's super easy. On iOS, simply start from the home screen in the app, swipe down until you see the mobile games row, and here you'll find Hades. After selecting it, you'll see an app store banner, and from there, you can easily start your adventure in the underworld. But Hades isn't the only gem you'll find. Netflix offers over 80 mobile games as part of your subscription. From puzzles to adventures, all games are available at no additional fees or ads. It's gaming simplified directly through your Netflix app. Thanks again to Netflix Games and Hades for supporting the channel today. And now, let's get into the useless Super Mario RPG facts. Like I said, I'll be going over facts from the second half of this game and beyond in this video, meaning there will be spoilers. So if you haven't been in this game yet, maybe go do that first, unless you don't care, in which case you can stick around. Last time we left off after the Star Road wishes, meaning our next destination is the sunken pirate ship. And already there's one of the most interesting secrets here in my opinion. Throughout the ship, you'll find a couple of these seemingly useless yellow pipes that you can't interact with at all. But in the captain's room where you fight Jonathan Jones, there's another one of those pipes, but this one you can interact with. And it lets you peek through it and see the other yellow pipes throughout the ships. I don't really understand why you can do this or how it even works logistically. But what am I here for if not to point out useless mechanics like this? And I mean, it is pretty cute. Also, I'm pretty sure the way they coded this is that it spawns an invisible Mario where the pipe is, because nearby enemies seem to aggro towards the exit of the pipes as if Mario was there. That's pretty funny. Before you get into the pirate ship, you get a weapon for Bowser called the Hurley Glove, and normally this makes Bowser throw Mario at the enemies. But if Mario currently has a status ailment, Bowser will actually whip out a little Mario doll to throw at the enemies, the same one Gas has, which is adorable. It could be a reference to how in the original game Mario would strangely be replaced by a tiny Mario during this attack, but that's honestly a bit of a stretch. Anyways, after the pirate ship, Spiritovich, disguised as Seaside Town's Elder, will ask you to hand over the star piece you just obtained. And if you decline, he'll say, so that's how you want to play it? What do you think will happen to the real inhabitants of Seaside Town? And then he'll send one of his henchmen into the building where the people of the town are being held captive, seemingly to torture the real elder as he begs for mercy and asks for them to stop. Dang. After this, the henchman returns and Spiritovich reveals that the elder is just being tickled. But if you say no again, he'll send two of his henchmen in to tickle the elder again, which even has some new dialogue. After this, the two henchmen return, and you can say no again to have all four henchmen get in there to tickle the elder, who this time screams in absolute horror. Every time you decline to give the star piece after this, the elder gets tickled by all four henchmen again, but he doesn't give a response. Maybe he passed out. After you defeat Spiritovich, you can open the door to the storage shed to save the townsfolk, who of course all thank you for letting them out. The Elder walks up to Mario last and he'll give you a reward, but what he gives you and what he says when he does actually changes depending on how many times you let him get tickle tortured. If he never gets tortured, he'll say, you exposed the fake townspeople and give up your star to save us, please take this with our thanks, and you get a flower box. If he got tickled once, he'll say, they did torture me a little, but it's nothing to worry about, here, this is for you, and gives you a flower jar. Two tickle sessions and he'll say, although they tortured me, I'm sure it was nothing compared to your trials, Mario. I'd hate to have to go through that tickle torture again though. I've gotta leave now, so please take this, and you get a flowered tab. And lastly, if you let him get tickled three or more times, he'll say, being the most important person in the village, it was inevitable that I would be tortured. Are you immune to tickle tortures, Mario? Oh yes, this is for you, please take it. And he only gives you one coin. Dang, yeah, don't let him get tickled. Considering he gives you progressively worse rewards, he probably also gets progressively more annoyed with Mario, despite being safe by him. That's pretty funny. After this point, one of the most well-known easter eggs becomes available, that being Samus from the Metroid series sleeping in the guest room of Mushroom Kingdom's castle. And if you talk to her, she'll say, I'm resting up for Mother Brain, who is an antagonist from her home series. 
Just like with Link earlier in the game, doing this adds an entry to the all-new scrapbook journal, this time called the Sleeping Bounty. And remember how I said that Link's entry had a couple clever puns written in the description? Well, Samus also gets a description, but there's only one pun in it, and it kinda sucks. Mallow writes, There was a cool person sleeping in a bed in the castle. I wanted to see what her thick pajamas felt like, but she stirred just before I could touch them, and Aaron away. Cause her full name is Samus Aaron. What the heck is that? What does it mean when you Aaron away? Is it a play on ran away? Not very subtle at all, Mallow. The puns on Link were actually kind of clever and smart, but this one, this ain't it. Just sounds weird if you ask me. Anyways, after this, you do some more journeying and eventually make it to a place called Balome Temple. This place isn't too spectacular, but there is a weird event here that can happen. While exploring this place, there's a chance for a small cloud to appear and move around. And if you jump into it, it turns out to be an enemy. But once in battle, the enemy is invisible and called formless. But if you attack it once, it reveals itself as a green cloud with a face called Gasox. This is literally the only way to encounter this enemy, and you can't run from it. It even plays one of the boss themes, technically making Gasox a completely optional mini-boss. You can also encounter Gasox at Land's End, the area before Balone's Temple, but I feel like it's way rarer to happen here, because not only did I not even know about it before doing research on this, but it took a while for me to encounter it here while actively trying to do so. So, that's weird. You don't get anything special for beating it, but both forms do have a Thought Peak entry, so you do need to encounter it at least once if you want to 100% complete the game. The boss of this place, Balome, is one you've fought before, but he has a new power this time around, namely the ability to eat a party member and then clone them. And what's cool is that he actually describes each party member's taste differently after eating them. For Mario he says, Ack, sour. For Gino he says, bitter, but not bad. For Bowser he says, yuck, how repulsive. For Peach he says, hmm, taste peachy. And my favorite is his reaction for Mallow, which is, yes, this is yummy. I just love how over the top it is with him yelling yes first. Mallow must be delicious as hell. Once he's summoned the clones of the party members, they fight pretty much how you would expect. But something really cool is that if you use Thought Peak on them with Mallow, you get to see that character's hidden thoughts. While Mario doesn't actually have any, it just being dot dot dot. I guess being a silent protagonist literally means you don't even have any thoughts, but everyone else does think something. The Mallow clone thinks, Mom? Dad? Where are ya? Which is pretty sad, actually. Gino's thoughts are, I need to collect star pieces, quick, which is boring but in character. Bowser's thoughts are, my radiant, resplendent keep. Pretty funny how he rolls his R's like that. And Peach's thoughts are my favorite, it being, it should be a crime to be so beautiful. Which I love because she's normally such a bland character in my opinion, but this line really gives her some, well, character. You know what I mean. After Balloon's Temple, you make it to my favorite town in the game, Monstro Town, where enemies that have chosen to live a normal life reside. The first thing you're supposed to do here is talk to Monster Mama, so she can call the Paratrooper squad over to help Mario out. And when she calls them, you have to wait for them to arrive, which doesn't take long to be fair. The sergeant asks their troops what their flying time was, to which they respond, 8.52 seconds. Sergeant Flutter then apologizes to Monster Mama for being 0.52 seconds late. However, if you time how long it took for them to enter the house after closing Monster Mama's text box calling them over, it takes them 5.19 seconds to arrive, meaning they were actually well on time, by 2.81 whole seconds if their goal was 8 seconds flat. Also in Monster Town are three Goomba triplets that act as a shop, but you can only buy standard mushrooms here, which are pretty bad at this point in the game. However, if you look at the description, it says recovers 30 HP, but dot dot dot, indicating that it's not the same as a normal mushroom, since those just say that it recovers 30 HP. Sure enough, if you use these odd mushrooms in battle, they do actually heal 30 HP, but they also turn you into a mushroom, making it so you can't attack for a while. Very cute detail if you ask me. Also, for some reason, you can't use these mushrooms on the character you're currently controlling, only on one of your other two party members, which is different from regular mushrooms, which you can use on yourself. Weird. Anyways, at this point of the game, you can go through a little side quest to eventually get a reusable item called the Star Egg, which plays an animation of three stars dancing with some sways of their bottom parts, making a little bird fly by, which somehow does 100 damage to all enemies. But here's one of the weirdest secrets in the entire game. For some reason, if you use the Star Egg with specifically Peach, the animation is slightly different. Did you see the difference? Probably not, right? The difference is that they do more bottom sways when Peach uses the item, and a bit faster too. 
I have no idea why they do that. But this was actually also in the original. That's a crazy attention to detail that they remade something so random and insignificant. I love that. Also, this isn't really a useless fact, but I just want to point out how stupid it is what you have to do to get the star egg. Namely having to win Look the Other Way against Great Guy, which is a luck based game, 100 times. As you can imagine, this takes a while. To be fair, I honestly love that they didn't change this at all from the original. But you gotta admit, this is a little nuts. At least it's memorable though. Anyways, Nimbus Land is the next main area, and there are a lot of fun secrets here. For starters, their inn has an option to pay double for a dream cushion. The only difference being that you'll get a little dream sequence while Mario is sleeping in it, of a character from your adventure talking to you. And there are a couple different ones you can get. There's one of Chancellor Toad from Peach's Castle saying, We're counting on you, Mario. One of Yoshi from Yoster Isle saying, Mario, good luck. In parentheses, of course. One of Gas from Rose Town saying, Gino, come on, you can do it. And one of that random jumping kid from the Mushroom Kingdom, jumping up and down and saying, Boing, boing, boing. I'm trying really hard. So Mario, you have to try hard too. I'm with you all the way. Which is really cute, honestly. Besides these, there are actually four more dreams that seem to be much rarer than the normal four. They have a bit more going on than just a character talking to you, and three of them will also make the innkeeper say something special to Mario when he wakes up. The one where the innkeeper has nothing to say has Mario and the bed he's sleeping in floating by, then stopping for a bit on the cloud island, and then floating further away. One has a big troopa enemy laying on top of Mario's bed and opening his mouth, which I assume is meant to be it yawning. After waking up, the innkeeper will say, it looked like you had nightmares. Is everything okay? One has a bunch of chef tortoise from Mary Moore in the room, along with some huge salt and pepper shakers in a much bigger room than normal. When waking up, the innkeeper will say, that's odd, it smells like pepper in here. Probably just my imagination. And the best one in my opinion has Toad jumping on Mario's bed, saying, yeah, yeah, Mario, I've kept this a secret until now, but I'm really a, a, a monster during which he transforms into a ghost enemy. When Mario wakes up, Toad will actually be standing next to your bed, to which Mario freaks out and runs to the corner to cower in fear. Then Toad walks up to him and says, Are you alright? You are kicking up a sweat. Here, drink this and blow those bad guys away. He then gives you a red essence to use and says, I guess this is goodbye. And then he walks off. For this one, the innkeeper will say the same thing as with the big troopa dream, which is him asking if you had nightmares and if everything is okay. Normally, near the end of the Nimbus Castle dungeon, you get a star man to run through a bunch of enemies, which suddenly includes the assistant of Valentina, Dodo, in a blink-and-you-miss-it moment. This is just meant to be a funny little moment since you fight them later on, including Dodo, but this is the only time in the game you encounter Dodo as a normal enemy. So what happens if you let your star man run out on purpose and intentionally start a fight with him? Well, they did actually make a unique fight for this if you do so. However, the only difference from his later fight is that he has 200 less HP, which is practically nothing at this point in the game. Also, you get to fight him with all three party members instead of just one like in his required fight, making this version of him very easy. Most interestingly though, is that they gave these two fights different thought peak entries. The first one that you're likely to miss is, I'm hungry. And the one in the second fight is, I'm still hungry. I should head home already. Poor guy, he really doesn't want to do any of this. This does mean that they're both separate entries in the monster list, which I find pretty funny. Speaking of the boss fight here, there's something I really want to mention because I'll probably never get the chance to again. In the original version, whenever you attacked Valentina, her breasts would jiggle a lot. And yeah, they didn't keep this in the remake. Which, I mean, I get it, but it was a pretty memorable aspect of this fight and the character. So it is a little bit of a shame. Though again, I understand the change. Sorry, I just really wanted to mention that for the people that never played the original and didn't know about that. Anyways, after you beat Valentina and save Mallow's parents, who are the king and queen of Nimbus land and thus own Nimbus castle, you can visit a specific room in the castle that now has gold statues of all the party members, with Prince Mallow of course standing in the middle. That's pretty cool. Also, if you visit Garo again, the maker of all the statues in the castle, you can see that he has an extra statue of Mallow and Peach, and one of a Goomba for some reason. And what's more, the Mallow statue specifically changes pose every time you re-enter his house. It can either be neutral, smiling, angry, or fallen over. Really random thing for them to program, but hey, it's my job to point stuff like this out. 
Speaking of hidden secrets that are available after you beat Valentina, if you for some reason decide to climb all the way back up Booster Tower again of all places, you'll get to see a hidden cutscene of Valentina being there with Booster. Valentina says, what are you babbling about? Why should I marry you? Booster then walks up to her, whispers something in her ear that we don't get to hear, walks to the edge of the balcony, and then Valentina says, what a wonderful thing to say. She then stands beside Booster, gets a little closer, and then Booster creates a bit more distance between them before Valentina once again gets close. Anytime after this, if you try to view this scene again, you just get a shot of them standing together with the Snifters looking away. Okay, but seriously though, what did Booster tell Valentina to make her go from ill why should I marry you to suddenly being on board and so attached to him? Please leave your theories in the comments, I'd love to know. This hidden scene actually does come back later, believe it or not. After you beat the final boss and get a little where are they now montage of some characters before the credits starts, you see Booster and Valentina getting married with Dodo acting as their marriage efficient, where Valentina again seems way more into Booster than he into her. To most people beating this game for the first time, this scene may feel extremely random, cause you normally never see these two interact at all, but it actually follows up from a completely missable cutscene, which I think is really neat. Also, remember how last video I went over how you can get Booster to recruit 4 more Snifsters, making for 7 in total, and that you could get an 8th one that gets rejected by Booster? Well, in this marriage scene, you can see that Booster now has 8 Snifsters, meaning that last one did get his wish after all. I absolutely love that, wow. This scene always happens and plays out the exact same way with 8 Snifsters and all, every time, regardless if you do that whole Snifster quest or watch that secret scene or not. Anyways, getting back to the story, after freeing King and Queen Nimbus, you gain access to the Royal Hot Spring in the clouds, which you can actually take a dip in, but if you stay for too long, Mario's face will turn red and he will jump out. Nice. After this you go through Barrel Volcano, and the only real interesting thing I can say here is that halfway through there's a guy called Cinder Toad running a store and an inn, and he has figurines of an Arwing from Star Fox, the Blue Falcon from F-Zero, and the Fire Stingray also from F-Zero. Wow, what a nerd, imagine collecting figurines. After you get the second to last star piece from the volcano, if you go back to King Nimbus and talk to him, he'll have new dialogue wishing you good luck in fixing the star road. But again, he doesn't know what it's actually called, so he calls it wrong, and he actually has a few different incorrect things he can say. You can either call it the star street, the star lane, or the star strip. I just love that he never gets it right. I wonder if that means his wish at Star Hill can never be granted, since he called it wrong there too. After this you go through Bowser's Keep for the second time, which is now overtaken by bad guys. But some of the enemies here are still from Bowser's army, so because Bowser is on your side now, those enemies can sense Bowser's presence and either won't attack you if they do, or they'll attack another enemy for you, and then they will always straight up run away on the second turn. But if you actually have Bowser as one of your active party members, they'll always run away on the first chance they get. Like I said, this easter egg only goes for enemies from Bowser's army, which are the Terracotta, Pro Goombas, and Malakupas, which are just green paratroopas. But strangely, this doesn't go for Grand Troopas, which are just chonky paratroopas, and thus also from Bowser's army. So, that's weird. Something that's not a useless fact, but I still really want to bring up, is that in the original game, there was a famous glitch that let you one-shot the boss of this dungeon, Exor, with a Geno Whirl. Which is funny, because Exor is like, a hugely important character in the plot of this game. I mean, its arrival is what sets off the entire story. They even dropped the game's title right at this moment with Exor. Now, something that caught me by complete surprise is that they actually kept this in the remake. Which is shocking. If you've ever wondered why this works, let me tell you. Geno Roll is an attack that lets you deal 9999 damage to any normal enemy if you time the attack perfectly. Bosses and mini bosses have something called a boss flag in the game's code that lets the game know they are a boss fight and thus should be immune to this one shot attack from Geno Roll, which they are because of this flag. The Exor fight is special because you can attack multiple points on its body, and the tip of the hilt is the part that you actually have to bring down to 0 HP to win the fight but you can't damage it unless you take out one of its eyes first. Doing so lets you damage the hilt of course, but it also removes Exor's boss flag for some reason, meaning it's no longer immune to the one-shot properties of Geno Roll, which means... 
This would have probably been extremely easy to fix, but I love that they just left it in. There's no way they weren't aware of it, because like I said, this oversight is insanely popular. It gets referenced in like every Mario RPG parody ever. So I'm convinced they only kept it in on purpose because of how beloved it is. That's awesome. Anyways, after Exor, you go through the factory, the final area of the game, and there isn't really anything interesting I can point out here, so let's move on to the credits. At the end of the parade, you get a cute scene of Mario and Peach sitting on a giant star parade float. Gino, now just a spirit, joins them, followed by Mallow and Bowser, and they all look up at some fireworks. The final firework you see depicts a mushroom, which is cool and all, but you can actually change the shape of this last firework by doing something in the game. All the way back in Mole Town, there's a guy that can sell you some fireworks for a whopping 500 coins. And normally these are only used to trade to a little girl for a shiny stone, which lets you open the door to the game's optional super boss. But by buying fireworks from this mole multiple times, the fireworks at the end of the credits changes. If you buy some either never, once or twice, it'll be the standard mushroom shaped blast. If you buy fireworks 3 or 4 times, it'll be a fire flower shaped blast. And if you buy fireworks 5 or more times, which totals up to a whopping 2,500 coins by the way, it'll be in the shape of a star. This is a cool secret and all, but honestly getting it can be really cumbersome, because you can't buy more fireworks if you still have some in your inventory. The mole will simply say he's out of stock. And similarly, you can only have one shiny stone as well, so you can't just trade each firework for extra shiny stones to be able to buy more fireworks. So you gotta do a bit more of a trading quest. You can trade the shiny stone for a carbo cookie to this girl in the store, and you can give the carbo cookie away to this little girl to either get a frog coin or get access to her bucket, which lets you play the Midas River minigame for free once. Like I said, the fireworks in the credits only changes once you've bought fireworks from the mole at least three times, meaning you have to do parts of this quest multiple times just to get the ability to buy more fireworks and see something different than the standard mushroom shaped blast. It's a cool secret, but man, they really should have just let you buy fireworks multiple times without needing to get rid of them first. But yeah, that's the end of the game. However, the remake adds something for the post-game that's not seen in the original, namely some rematches with a couple of the non-Smithy gang bosses, and this comes with a bunch more useless facts for me to go over. For starters, every boss you can rematch makes a new wish on Star Hill, which you can of course read and tie back to who made them, and they even get updated after you finish their rematch. Balone's new wish is, my throat's all scratchy, make it stop, which turns into, I'd like to try eating a frog someday, after the rematch. Okay. Punchinello's new wish is, I hope this is my big break, which turns into, I want to join Bowser's minions after the rematch, since Bowser gets impressed by him and invites him to help clean up his keep, which Punchinello seems happy about. Booster's wish is, I've got something special to show off, which changes to, that doll was something special after the rematch, referring to Gino of course. Chef Tortoise's new wish is, I wish someone would do something about this cake, which turns into, I wish I could make a normal cake, which is pretty funny. Again, sorry for the bad accent. Jonathan Jones's wish is, I'm itching for a heated duel, and turns into, I hope that guy wins his corker of a fight with the smithy creature, with that guy of course referring to Mario, since his rematch is a 1v1 against just him. And the last two actually get three different wishes, but for both of them I didn't get footage of one of the wishes, and I can't go see them anymore. So you'll just have to trust me. Jinx's first wish is, I want a match with someone who makes me take it seriously, which changes once you've defeated him a third time into, I want our master to show us his moves, as an invitation to the rematch. And once you've cleared that, it turns into, I wish we had at least one more student, because his fight is all about the all new trio attacks, but his dojo only consists of him and one other student. So he wishes he had a third one, just so they could do trio attacks as well. That's pretty funny. And lastly, Kulex. His initial wish before you fight him in his normal form is, I, the Dark Knight of Vonda, awaits the one destined to challenge me. Changing into, I have returned, having attained even greater power. I await the one destined to challenge me once again, after beating him the first time. And it changes once again into, I await the destined one's return, after beating him as Kulex 3D. The main rematch I actually want to talk about this video is the Balom one, because just like earlier, he can clone your party members and they have different thought peak entries again, indicating more of their inner thoughts. Mario's is now just an exclamation mark, still repping his role as the silent protagonist. Malo's is now, I'm afraid to go to the bathroom at night. Bowser's is now, what a rollicking good time. Peach's is now, hey Chancellor, I'm the pretty one, right? And lastly, Gino's new thoughts are actually kinda nuts, 
it's now. Truth is, I don't care one bit about star pieces. Like, huh? What the hell, man? That's your entire mission. The entire reason you came down here and possessed that doll. You even said earlier that you have to find them, and quick. You could argue that yeah, these are the thoughts of the clones and thus don't represent the originals, but personally I see it as the originals' most secret thoughts. I mean, that kinda lines up with some of the others, and I think it adds some fun depth to the character of Gino. Speaking of Gino, after the rematch against Booster, he gives him the Stella 023 as a weapon. The 023 in the name might seem a bit random, but it's probably just a reference to the fact that this remake came out in 2023, so that's pretty neat. Anyways, after you finish the boss rematches, if you go and beat the game again, the endings Where Are They Now montage gets updated with the bosses, since they've all become friendly with you now, and most of them seem to indicate that their last wishes on Star Hill came true. Bloom is present at Todovsky and Frog Sage's musical performance at Tadpole Pond, probably to try and eat a frog while he's there. The two chef tortoises are at Booster and Valentina's wedding now, probably because they baked a normal cake for it. Jinx and his pupil Jagger are now present at the Dancing Star Slaps dance performance, maybe to try and invite it to join their dojo, with Kulix even showing up in the background since it is in Monster Town after all. And Punchinello can be seen helping Bowser's army clean up his keep as part of his army, just as he wished for. Strangely, Jonathan Jones' scene doesn't get updated at all, which I'm not gonna complain about because that shot is super iconic and beloved in the fanbase as is. Can't improve much in perfection, you know what I mean? And I guess his last wish did come true anyways, since seeing this scene means you beat Smithy, which is what Jonathan wished for. Nothing changes with Booster as well, since he was already getting married. But like I said, that scene is still updated with the Chef Tortoises being there now, and I guess his new wish didn't come true because it really wasn't a wish, more so a statement. Kulex's new wish is just him saying he hopes Mario returns sometime, which, I mean, you can do that whenever you want, meaning you yourself can make that wish come true. Anyways, that just leaves one final fact for me to share. If you wait a while on the the end screen after the credits, a music box rendition of the classic Super Mario Bros. theme will play. Man, I love this game, and this remake is just fantastic. I love how much attention they gave to all the little secrets this game is known for, no matter how small or obscure. Personally, I couldn't be happier with how this remake turned out. Big thanks to Wright the Yoshi, Giant Firing Cole, Exo Bear, The Flying Fire, Sheen for the Win, LureFX1, Sil700, Lime the Chef, Kirk, and the rest of my lovely Patreon supporters, both past and present. As much as I love this game, it's not my favorite Mario RPG. That title goes to Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, which is also getting a remake soon, and you best believe I'll be making some similar content for that game as well. So if you enjoyed this video, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. And why not leave a like while you're at it, I would really appreciate it. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope to see you again sometime. Have a wonderful rest of your day.